So uh, my name is James McGrath and I'm a religion professor at Butler. I've uh, worked at Butler for 17 years, have enjoyed it immensely, and the thing I'm going to be talking about mostly today is one of the reasons why. Um, I teach, uh, I started out in the field of New Testament early Christianity, uh, and that's where I first encountered the Mandaeans that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, but at Butler, I also talk about a number of side interests and things like that. So next semester, uh, if any of you have been looking at religion courses to see what religion courses are going to be offered. Uh, I teach a course on religion and science fiction, and so, you know, do stuff like this, you know, in the background, and at least for telling you briefly about that. Um, I also have taught online before and like Zoom a lot, as you can probably tell, uh, but thought I would join you from the Jordan River for a number of reasons. One is, you know, maybe at some point if we can all study abroad again, I will take students to the Holy Land. I've done that in the past. But the Jordan River is one of the sites that I found particularly interesting to visit. And it's a place that's mentioned and Jordan is a key term for the Mandaeans, and I'll explain why in a bit. But I also think it's really cool that you can have like video in the background as I'm talking to you. And so, uh, I don't know how if that's coming through okay, but can you all see a lot it? better than me talking to you from my office with like cabinets in the background and stuff like that. So I hope you're enjoying the semester. Uh, I love this course uh, called Heresy, um, although I'm sure that the term heresy has been problematized and uh, <laughs> some issues with that have come up. And so how does somebody who does New Testament, even somebody who can be distracted into studying science fiction, end up studying the Mandaeans? And who are these people anyway? And why are they really unique out of all the topics that you might study in a course like this one? And the short answer is that the Mandaeans are the last surviving Gnostic group that's made it from ancient times down to the present day. So there's been something of a revival of Gnosticism in our time. And there are like brand new Gnostic churches that have sprung up and things like that. And it would be interesting to talk about those groups and their sort of eclectic use of ancient things. But as you've probably already learned from Gnostic texts that you've looked at, this is, you know, in antiquity, this is a group that has a very distinctive view of creation, of the material world, of, and as a result also of salvation and other things like that. Have you talked about the fact that even the term Gnosticism is quite controversial? Well, we've Where's talked the about the fact that it's controversial, but they don't yet fully understand why. Right. And the, I'd say the main reason uh, to keep that brief so that I get on to the main topic uh, without getting too distracted. I've already mentioned the fact that, you know, it's like, ooh, shiny new topic. I can be taken off course very easily. Uh, Jessica Stein is one of several people in this group that can probably tell you, uh, attest to that, uh, working with her on something to do with religion and music, which is another side interest of mine. Gnostic is a term, for the most part, that was used by the folks known as the early church fathers as a label for people they disagreed with. And so one objection to the use of this term is the fact that it seemed to be a label that was used, was applied to certain groups by others. And within the texts that are identified as Gnostic, they don't say, hi, we're the Gnostics and we'd like to tell you about ourselves. Remember, the Gnostics. 1-800-Gnostics, in case you want to reach us, that sort of thing, right? It's not a term they use as a self-designation. The Mandaeans might actually be the exception to that rule, though, and that's why I'm a little bit more comfortable using it in reference to them. So the Mandaeans are actually referred to by a number of terms and refer to themselves in a number of different ways, and all of them are interesting, and all of them tell us something about them. Uh, sometimes we don't know what, but that's one of the things that makes them intriguing. They still exist today, and yet that doesn't mean that the question of where they come from originally 
uh, who they are, their history, these things are still quite mysterious in a lot of ways. Among the terms that are used for them and that they use for themselves, when we get the term Mandaeans in texts, and I'm, I pronounce that way, oftentimes English speakers say Mandaeans, and that's fine. Uh, I collaborated on a book project with a, a linguist, uh, to be very specific, a Semitic philologist, and uh, he knows several dialects of Aramaic, including Mandaic, uh, speaks Arabic, and the Mandaeans refer to themselves, whether in Aramaic or in Arabic, using a word that sounds more like Mandaean, Mandaia. And so they prefer that way of pronouncing their name, and so I've been trying to make a concerted effort to do that. But I've met a number of Mandaeans, and they will be very happy that you know who they are and say anything about them, uh, however you pronounce their name. But in their texts, Mandaeans tends to be a term for lay people, and then there's a term that's used for priests, people who have this esoteric knowledge, this insider knowledge, this specialist understanding of things that not everyone has. And they are referred to as Nasireans. And that's fascinating to me, as somebody who's started out in this by way of the study of early Christianity, because that sounds a lot like the term that you get in the New Testament sometimes for early Christians, for Jesus, uh, Paul is referred to in Acts as a ringleader of the Nasireans. Is this a, is there any connection? You know, those are some of those intriguing historical questions that we might ask. They're also sometimes referred to in Arabic as the Sabians, Sabiun, which means immersers or baptizers. Baptism is their predominant ritual. Uh, Dr. Saxon put some videos of Mandaean baptisms on canvas for you but you can also find them on YouTube just by searching for them. And one of the things that makes this group so interesting, so important is you'll have encountered as you looked at some other so-called Gnostic texts from ancient times, there are a lot of things about them that are puzzling. Am I right? I mean, is that a safe statement? Uh, there are some things that are not self-explanatory. That's also true of the Mandaeans, and that's even true for Mandaeans, right? Um, I'll say more about that in a moment. But these texts are supposed to be mysterious in a lot of ways, and sometimes they're ones that you're supposed to have to puzzle out. But reading them after centuries, millennia have passed, it's like we've lost the answer key, right? The people who are like, okay, well, we'll put it in this way, and then we'll understand what we're talking about, right? And then when people bump up against the mystery, we'll show off our knowledge by explaining it to them and things like that. With the Mandaeans, we at least have the opportunity to observe lived practice. And so you can actually see their baptism, right? You can see what it is that they do, how they practice it. And so I have some pictures to share with you, but why don't I make my background just for a little bit, a scene of a Mandaean baptism. And if you ever get to see a Mandaean baptism on YouTube, you'll see that it's crucially important to most Mandaeans that it be in flowing water. The Aramaic term for that is living water. They dress all in white, a symbol of purity. And as you'll know from things like you know, Christian baptism, there's a long history of Christians wearing white in order to immerse themselves. And so the question of how this relates to Christianity is an interesting one. For the Mandaeans, baptism is something that is a regular practice. So it's not something that you do one time as a mark of conversion, of initiation into the group. In fact, in the present day, at least, they don't accept converts. It's a repeated ritual that one does to seek forgiveness, to seek a connection with the light world, the world above, the world where the, the supreme divinity and the good deities are located uh, beyond our own material world, which is under the power of forces of darkness, uh, including the, the creator that made this world which is the creator God of the Jewish scriptures and thus also of the Christian scriptures. And so there's some interesting things about that, which uh, we'll talk more about. But the opportunity to observe their lived practice is I think one of the things that makes the Mandaeans particularly fascinating. And so I don't know whether we wanna stay with that or whether I wanna go back to the Jordan River. Uh, they actually use a number of terms for 
water that is used appropriate for baptism. One of them is Jordan, right? They actually use that word Jordan for any baptismal water that um, is used. And they use the term living water for it. Now, why do they call it a Jordan, right? And that in itself is interesting. Does that have a connection with the Jordan River? Does that have a connection with these things? And so it's at this point that it's worth mentioning that John the Baptist features prominently in Mandaean sources. And they're very fond of him. They don't view him as their founder, but they view him as one of their own, as maybe the most famous Mandaean in history, and one who did a lot to promote their beliefs. And my next big book project, after I finish a few of the things I'm working on now or have uh, in the pipeline, will be a follow-up to uh, the translation that I did recently of a Mandaean text, which I'll say a bit more about. But I do want to do some work on the historical figure of John the Baptist and ask questions like, does their repeated practice of baptism tell us anything about John? That's something I'll happily say more about if there's interest. But one of the things I'm aware of is that I'm probably much, much more interested in this topic than any of you will ever be, um, no matter how persuasively I talk about them today. And so I will try to give some brief overview and then go into more detail as there is interest. Because for some of you, they much, might be interested in the ways that they're distinctive and different from Christians and Jews and others. For some of you, the question of what they might tell us, if anything, about John the Baptist and thus about Jesus and the origins of Christianity might be interesting. And uh, Andy Kassler will have heard me talk about them at least a little bit, very briefly, in a uh, course on the historical Jesus, because we talk about John and John's influence on Jesus and those kinds of things. And so the Mandaeans should come into the picture when talking about that. But if we come back to the terms that the Mandaeans have been known by, I, I mentioned that another one is Sabians. Uh, has anyone here taken either Global and Historical Studies course that touched on Islam? or a course that touched on the Quran at all, um, any of you. And so you may have come across some references, right? There are references to people of the book, right? Uh, that are worshipers of the same God, have received revelation. Sometimes they're criticized, but they're nonetheless recognized as having a certain validity to them. And sometimes it's Jews and Christians, but on a couple of occasions, there are references to the Jews, the Christians, and the Sabians. And Islamic scholars down the ages debated who those Sabians are, but probably the most likely answer, historically speaking, is that they were the Mandaeans. And the Mandaeans, as we know them today, are found throughout the world, but historically they were located throughout most of their history, predominantly in the River Valley region, the border region where Iran and Iraq meet. So what we might categorized geographically as Mesopotamia. And that was predominantly Islamic context throughout much of the history that we know of them. And we actually have Islamic sources that talk about the Sabians of the marshes and whether they are the same as the Sabians of Haran, who were worshipers of the stars and had a similar sounding name. And so sometimes the Mandaeans were accepted as people of the book and a legitimate religion in this Islamic context. And sometimes they were viewed as star worshipers and polytheists, which they, which doesn't fit their the description. Uh, they do, like all Gnostics, have a number of emanations from the Supreme God. And so whether they should be called monotheists is another question, but they certainly have viewed themselves as such. And if Christians as Trinitarians can be viewed as monotheists, then arguably so can Mandaeans. That's also something we can get into if there's interest, but uh, we'll see. But because of the question of their status, the ambiguity of the possible references to them in the Quran, they haven't been able to simply be accepted in the context in which they found themselves. And so sometimes they've been discriminated against or harassed, sometimes they've been persecuted. And they have interesting history of, an interesting history of trying to fly under the radar of authorities and to get in with various groups that were in power. And so during the colonial era, they came to be known by another term that you'll sometimes find used to them, for them, uh, they, though they never really used it for themselves, which was St. John Christians. 
as colonial powers like the Portuguese expanded their reach into India, into the Middle East, they came across Christians that claimed to have a historic connection with some apostle or someone like that. So the Thomas Christians of India were another fascinating group. Uh, they're the only reformed Eastern Orthodox church, which means they're basically out of communion with just about everyone except for uh, the Anglican Episcopal churches. So shout out to Father Charles's denomination there. There we go. They accept everybody. So there you go, pretty much. And so having encountered that group, which was associated with Thomas, when the Portuguese came across this group in the Middle East that mentioned John, they said, oh, St. John Christians, right? Who their patron saint is John the Baptist. There we go. And they accepted baptism from them from these missionaries and things like that, but they continued practicing their own baptism, which is a repeated baptism. And eventually the priests, the Catholic priests that had brought Catholicism to the region in that form, realized, yeah, we don't think these people are Christians after all. And that's actually true, right? So these are Gnostics, but they're not Christian Gnostics. Uh, they're baptizers, and since I actually am a member in a Baptist church, uh, I actually told my Sunday school class I teach once when I was going to a conference about the Mandaeans, I'm going to a conference about non-Christian Baptists. And I did that trying to be funny, but the puzzled looks were, you yeah, know, that was exactly what I was aiming for. And so it worked out pretty well. But this is a group that I think really deserves a lot more attention than they've gotten. And so if you were to ask me, how did I end up interested in them? You know, I mean, the short answer is, Everyone should find them fascinating because they really are. And I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, I recently took the group that's, that went on gala this semester. Uh, they had a really rough time of it between a uh, faculty member leaving just beforehand so that people like me had to fill in in their place, bushfires, and then, of course, coronavirus and people being recalled and things. So not a great semester for study abroad. Um, but then again, I'd like to take people to Iraq and Iran to learn about the Mandaeans, and that's never going to happen. So at least they got a little bit of time in Australia. But the, the Mandaeans, because they have faced persecution in their homeland, are located all over the world. And there is a huge community in the suburbs around Sydney, um, in areas where there are rivers. And so I had a chance to meet with some Mandaeans while I was on this trip. And we'll show you some pictures from that trip. But how does somebody like me get interested in them in the first place? The short answer is by way of the New Testament. And in the early to middle of the 20th century, there was a school of thought, particularly in Germany, but also in the English speaking world, that thought that the Mandaeans were, in fact, really the background to the Gospel of John in the New Testament. The Gospel of John in the New Testament, that's a different John, that's John, one of the 12 apostles, different from John the Baptist, who features in Mandaean texts. And I did my doctor work on the Gospel of John, how Jesus is depicted in the Gospel of John, and so came across them, but didn't really dig into them at that point. As I was working on teaching, developing a course on extra-canonical early Christian literature and Gnosticism, which we fondly know as the heresy course at Butler, I was looking for things to give students to read that would be interesting and said, oh yeah, the Mandaeans. Oh yeah, they're still around. And nowadays you don't have to go to the Middle East to see their baptism. You can see it on YouTube. This is like unprecedented. This is a new era for the study of this group. Let me assign some excerpts from their texts. And that's when it became, you know, I really became aware that their two most important sacred texts, the Great Treasure and the Book of John, had not been translated into English in their entirety. And I was like, how can this be? All right, this group is so interesting. And so there happened to be a lot of books about the Mandaeans over at Christian Theological Seminary, which is now located on Butler University's South Campus. Uh, Butler students can access there, so you can go and look at some of these texts. And I started dabbling, and when I went to the first conference that I ever attended on the Mandaeans, I wondered whether I'd even be accepted. I wondered whether I'd be like this interloper 
Like, what's he doing here? Like, what's, who does he think he is coming to, yeah. And it turns out that with maybe one exception, everybody who works on the Mandaeans, apart from a scholar named Yoran Buckley, who recently retired, who really did make this her, her central focus, pretty much everybody else dabbles in the study of the Mandaeans. So they study New Testament, but do some work on the Mandaeans. They study Coptic Gnostic texts, but they do a little on the Mandaeans. They study Aramaic dialects, but do things on Mandaic as a dialect of Aramaic. And so I fit right in there. And I met a scholar from, uh, a, a linguist from the university uh, in New Jersey, uh, Rutgers University, who was at the conference. And together we applied for an NEH grant and worked on putting together a grant proposal and then created a translation of the Mandaean Book of John. And so I have a copy here uh, so I can show it to you. Uh, let's see, how do I, yeah, it's not going to come through in there, is it, because of the background? But here's one I prepared earlier. And so here I am at a conference uh, when the book was launched. So it just came out in November, just in time for the conference. Can you see the picture I'm sharing? Is that show up on your end? Okay, good. And so we put together uh, a grant project. We got a follow-up grant as well. And we worked together on this. And it really is it really was a fascinating text to work on. So their manuscripts, their texts are fascinating. And so I put a little glimpse inside our translation on the screen there behind me. Uh, this is so much fun to be able to do all this stuff with Zoom. Uh, but th there are a lot of texts of theirs and some of them are just unbelievably fascinating. Their language, right, their sacred texts are written, written in a dialect of Aramaic, and they're written in a distinctive alphabet, which has no known secular usage, right? So it's found on what are known as incantation bowls, right? They're used for magical purposes, and they're used in their sacred texts. And so my view is that probably these were Aramaic speakers in Mesopotamia who just spoke the local dialect of Aramaic. They didn't think of themselves as needing a different alphabet for ordinary use, but for their religious purposes, they had secret knowledge and they wrote it in an alphabet that helped keep the secret and added to some of the mystery. Um, that said, you can read these texts and you can dive in. We've made an open access version of the translation and commentary available. And so you can find that online. But when I visited Australia recently, I had the opportunity to see some texts that members of the Man living Mandayan community had. And so I met with the only person who is a Mandayan priest and a scholar of religion. Uh, and his name is uh, Brika Nasaraya, and he teaches um, at a university in Sydney. And so at the University of Sydney, in fact. And so I had a chance to meet with him as well as with um, another scholar of religion who works on this subject. And then I had a chance to meet with uh, the Mubaraki family uh, who live on the outskirts, the, you know, the far in the outskirts of Sydney, I think a little over an hour from there. And they have copies of scrolls that they've made themselves, right, from earlier copies. And some of these scrolls are illustrated, right? And so when you see the illustrations in these scrolls that talk about the rivers that are so important to the Mandaeans, uh, talk about the world above and use illustrations to represent uh, the, the world above, sacred figures, things like that. I mean, these, these texts are just so fascinating. Um, and I'm actually working with um, a, another student on an honors thesis. Uh, she's major in music as well as in religion. And there's this point in one of these texts known as the um, Dewan Avatur, or the scroll of Avatur. Avatur is this figure who basically is at the border between the good world above and the created world. And so he kind of, he kind of oversees the purgatories that souls sometimes pass through and face suffering in before they reach the world above if they haven't quite uh, lived righteous lives. And a scroll about 
those purgatories called the Duan Abitur. Uh, they have a copy of this. So I got to see it while I was on this visit. But it depicts like ships that carry you through the world above. So the river, rivers, you know, are full of water that comes down from the heavens. And so in a lot of systems of thought, rivers are a point of connection between the world above and the world below. And so it's not surprising that people use, have seen immersion in water that comes from above as a way of connecting with the heavenly realm of seeking forgiveness. And that's exactly what the Mandaeans do. But there's one point in these scrolls where it seems to be depicting people being depict people being tortured in the afterlife using musical instruments. And so I was like, okay, this would be something interesting for some, a student who works on religion, is interested in religion and the Mendayans to work on. And so you can see there, close to Mr. Mubaraki, there are some figures that have symbols and horns and things like that. And so initially I was like, yeah, and Tom, sorry, um, I don't think they're playing jazz, if that makes you feel any better. But uh, as initially I was like, does this correlate with a, a negative view of music, right? What's going on here? Right? And I'm going to put one of their scrolls, uh, the scroll of the rivers in the background there behind me. But actually it was interesting. These are people who've either they themselves or the previous generation left the Middle East and they still have strong connections with there. And so it's interesting what they thought of when they thought about this. They actually thought about Guantanamo Bay and the use of music, right, loud blaring music to keep people up and to basically as a form of torture. And so apparently human beings have been doing that for millennia and Symbols, clashing symbols and horns are the loudest instruments that ancient people had. And so not surprising that people use that for torture then and thought maybe in the afterlife people will use this as well. Uh, so when musicians ask me, well, what instruments they use, you know, if, if Doug Spaniel asks me, I say, oh, they, they, you know, they depict them being tortured with bassoons and things like that. But I don't, you know, it is actually just these loud, essentially sources of noise that um, we have here, right? And so I was really honored to have the chance to meet with these representatives of the Mandayan community. <coughs> and one of the things that's fascinating about them, right, if you see pictures of them being baptized, of course, you get the impression that these are this, you know, very pious group that has this, you know, do they wear white all the time, things like that. And it's really important to get to know ordinary people, right? as well as look at their sacred texts, which have these fascinating illustrations in them. Right. But yeah, getting a chance to hold them was pretty cool. So I, I didn't miss the photo opportunity. And so let me see if I can scroll through the photos quickly. I have some pictures of baptism. These are just taken off of Google. And you can find lots of pictures and videos showing Mandayan baptism, showing their sacred texts, the distinctive alphabet that it's written in, their symbols. This is the drabsha, right? It's the banner that's important, but it looks like, you know, something you might see, you know, Good Friday, Easter Sunday in a church, right? A banner draped on a cross. But the cross itself is just a cross beam that's used to hold the banner, which is the important part. But why is this imagery so similar? There's a glimpse inside our translation. That's the one that I had in the background behind me. So we actually, one of the reasons the project took many years was it's a difficult language. There are a lot of obscurities in the language. A lot of things are difficult to translate. But also we developed a new font in order to be able to print this language in the original alphabet, right? Older translations sometimes used Hebrew or Aramaic characters or did other things or just transliterated it into English. We want it to be in the Mandayan text. We didn't, weren't going to write it by hand. We wanted a typeset font that would make it look the way it's supposed to look or do a print version of that. If any of you are art majors and are interested, I have somebody who is interested in um, doing some font design. And so if you'd like to try your hand at this, um, I could get you a chance to work on a, a really fascinating project related to that. 
Uh, among the difficult passages in the text that we're working on, the book of John, is essentially a parable about fishing, right? And so there are things in there that are reminiscent of things you might find in the New Testament. There's a passage about a good shepherd. Uh, there's a parable about fishing uh, called the, we call it the soul fisher passage. And it makes a lot of references to actual fish. And guess what? That's kind of hard to translate, right? Unless you have detailed knowledge of fish in a region. And so the last time uh, the Mandayan Book of John was translated into a European language in its entirety was uh, Mark Lidzbarski's edition in German. And he almost gave up when working on this chapter uh, because, or this passage, two chapter long passage, because it was just too difficult to figure out what these words mean. And as he traveled by boat between Germany and the Middle East, he asked people on the boat, do you have a term for a fish in your native dialect of Arabic that sounds like this? And things like that, and didn't make a lot of progress and was hit a lot of challenges. My collaborator in this project, who's uh, fluent in modern Arabic and uh, Farsi, as well as other things, got in touch with an Iraqi uh, fishing organization and asked them questions and you know, helped make a lot of progress. And we were able to figure out a number of puzzles there. And so technology, the modern era, helps with the study of the Mandaeans in all kinds of interesting ways, right? You can connect with Mandaeans around the world. We got digital access to manuscripts of this text that are in the private possession of Mandayan priestly families. And we ask questions about fish um, to people all over the world. So one, of the, one other thing I'll mention about the Mandayans is that they will build this mud hut called a Mandi, right? Uh, so Mandayan, Mandi. And the priests will perform certain rituals in there. And in order to not step outside of the, the, the flowing water, they actually bring water to there and then from there so that the priests are, can constantly be connected to the water as they perform certain aspects of the ritual in a, in a secluded secret place there. But I also met with some young people, right? And one of the things that was really striking meeting some of these young people, um, Oh, there's the scrolls again. Uh, there's another young Mandayan couple that I had a chance to meet. But that first couple, they're actually the second ones I met with near Sydney, uh, connected with me through Facebook, right, which again is fascinating. Uh, and social media is providing a sense of community for groups that don't always have a critical mass of people in one local area. But the other thing that I learned as I met with uh, these people in person for the first time is that connected with me through my blogging about the Mandaeans, so set up a Google alert for words of that sort, found my blog, and started reading my blog in order to learn more about their own tradition, because they grew up not knowing a lot about it. Right? One of them went to Catholic school, for instance. And so it's really fascinating to think about the fact that you know, they were treating me as an authority about their religion. And that was daunting and humbling. And so I'm continuing to work on this subject. I think that the Mandaeans do actually have some important things to tell us about the historical figure of John the Baptist. I think there are some reasons to think that some details in their sacred texts actually ultimately stem from some historical knowledge. The writing of them may be so far removed and the recording of these things may be so far removed from the history that they're only snippets and fragments of it. But if we had no New Testament, if all we had about Jesus and Christianity, the earliest things we had were things like the kinds of things you've been reading this semester, right? The, you know, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Thomas, things that were found at Nag Hammadi, things from the third century and afterwards. Historians would be all over them trying to figure things out. And so we have very little about John the Baptist, right? We have some brief mentions in the New Testament, the Gospels, mentioned in the Quran, mentioned by the historian Josephus. The Mandaean sources tell us things that I think are worth considering, but also their practice is an important one to consider as we think about what John did 
and how it may have influenced Christianity, but also how Christianity may have departed from that influence. So one thing I think is interesting is that for the Mandaeans, baptism is a repeated ritual, a repeated rite. And one of the things that they, one of the things that they do is, right, they, they're baptized in a river, right, known as a Jordan, to seek forgiveness. And if for John the Baptist, his ritual was essentially an alternative to sacrifice, to animal sacrifice, or an alternative way of seeking forgiveness, then having that be a repeated rite would make a lot of sense. And so even just bringing their current day ritual into the picture and asking questions based on that, I think says some interesting, you know, gives us some interesting possibilities to explore. So in the excerpts that Professor Saxton, Saxon shared with you, uh, there's a distinctive Mandaean account of you know, John not wanting to baptize Jesus for different reasons that you get in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, there are all kinds of other things. I didn't want to assume that you've read those, and I also didn't want to repeat things that you might already know about. Um, I realized that we are far enough along in our time that I probably should move to take, making this more conversational and asking some questions. But essentially, one of the distinctive features of the Mandaeans, and with this I'll move over to questions, one of the most distinctive features about them among Gnostics, right, among the groups that are categorized as that, is the fact that we have from Nag Hammadi, we have from other places, Christian Gnostics, right, so for instance the Valentinians, who clearly esteem Jesus as a figure who comes into the world, re reveals truth, uh, can lead people to salvation, and then Gnostic sources that don't seem to have any connection with Christianity and might be Jewish Gnostic or some other kind of thing. The Mandaeans have the features of those Jewish Gnostic texts, um, things like Sethian Gnosticism, but they're not fans of Jesus. And so they're quite distinctive from other Gnostics that we, we find and yet have similarities to all of them. And I think they're worth uh, worth learning more about. So I hope I, I hope you found this introduction to the Mandaeans and this overview of them from ancient times to the present day interesting, or at least tolerable. Um, you didn't have something else to do. You're stuck at home. This is you know, this is this is um, this is the, just the kind of thing you're looking for during a pandemic, right? What should I do? Get on Google. Learn about some random thing. Well, the Mandaeans can seem pretty random, uh, but they have a direct connection to this course. And so I hope you found this at least more interesting than most random people looking for uh, pandemic entertainment or something like that. So what questions do you have either based on things that I've said or based on things that you read about them, uh, things that you were typing in the background as I was talking about them and said, ooh, let me look that up or something like that. Uh, let's hear some questions. Yeah, so Emma. Um, so you said that they don't try to, they don't take converts, like, in this day and age, so is it a shrinking religious group, or how do they get new members, or do they even look for new members at all? Yeah, so they do not accept converts. There's some reason, based on their text, to think that they did at some point, or at least there was a way that people who weren't Mandaeans became Mandaeans. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about the mentions in the, their sacred texts about that is that there's reference in particular to people moving from Judaism to Mandaism and that being parallel to the move from Mandaism that is layperson status mm -hmm. as a Mandaean, as a Gnostic, to being a priest, right? becoming ordained, being initiated into the rituals. And so I, my view is that they actually probably emerged out of a Jewish context at some point and accepted people from that context. Um, from that background, because that was their own background themselves. <clears throat> I suspect that not accepting converts was probably a response to uh, the predominantly Islamic context in which they found themselves in. Converting from Islam to another religion can be extremely controversial. It's one of the most controversial things you can do in the context of Islam within certain Islamic contexts at, at, at any rate, right? Um, it's viewed as apostasy and it's viewed as one of the most terrible sins. And in the view of some, it should be punished by death, right? And so if you 
get converts to your religion, I mean, that person could be in trouble, but also it might bring unwanted hostility onto your community. And so I think that may have been a motivating factor. But yeah, so they are shrinking. And between the fact that they're shrinking, between the fact that they are increasingly scattered into much smaller communities than even their small one in the Middle East, given the fact that the communities that exist are divided often, sometimes along national lines, linguistic lines, you know, the Iraqi Mandaeans and the Iranian Mandaeans have some differences. Uh, different priests, you know, people have different fans and things like that. They are in danger of disappearing. And so one reason for wanting to draw attention to them at this point is that on the one hand, I think scholars like myself can help them preserve their tradition and their identity by translating their texts into languages that Mandaeans in places like Sydney or in Boston or San Antonio can read. Uh, but also because we might lose the chance to see some of these things, even if some of them preserve their identity, some of the knowledge is in danger of being lost uh, as it doesn't get passed on very effectively to next generations because the key elements of the ritual and the key elements of knowledge about their traditions lies in the hands of priests. And as you'll know, in a lot of, uh, a lot of traditions that focus on priesthood, oftentimes priests know things and do things like pronounce forgiveness. And all you do is show up at the time that you're told to and go through whatever ritual or say whatever things the priest tells you to and walk away trusting that you are being forgiven. Right? Um, I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but there are traditions of Christianity which have at least some similarity to that. Uh, this is an esoteric religion, and so, in fact, when uh, Lady Drower was uh, the wife of a, a diplomat in the Middle East uh, in the 20th century, who actually befriended this community and actually is responsible for the biggest uh, library collection of their texts, as well as the translation of some of them, uh, but as she translated texts, as texts were given to her, copies were made for her, that was controversial in and of itself because there were priests who were like, you can't t share this knowledge with people. This is secret priestly knowledge. Um, and now it's online, right? I mean, this is, you know, this is not something that everybody is necessarily happy about. But the translation of some of these texts is actually something that is appreciated by Mandaeans who are able to explore their own tradition in interesting ways but today they don't accept converts. And that's, that's actually a, a point that's under discussion in new ways, because if you marry outside the faith, then the tradition is that you, you know, basically the, the Mandaean line ends with you. And so it doesn't get passed on to your children. And so the question of whether a spouse of a Mandaean at least could convert, and then the children could be considered Mandaeans and brought up in the faith and things like that, uh, there are communities discussing this but there's a lot of controversy. And at the moment, it's still not something that's done generally. Other questions or things that grabbed your interest, things that you wanna hear more about? So I know that you just finished working on this book, but what do you see yourself doing with this research in the future? So my next big project, I don't think I'm going to do another major translation project. That said, I might, um, depends on what other people do. I really couldn't have done this, couldn't have done anything close to what we ended up producing without working closely with somebody who was actually you know, an expert, not just in you know, Aramaic, dialects of Aramaic, but his doctoral work was on a, a spoken dialect that's persisted down to the present day, although that's really in danger of disappearing, but a spoken dialect of Mandaic. And so real, you know, real linguistic expertise is needed. And having come in by way of New Testament studies, right, I've done some Aramaic, but you really, you know, with, without somebody who does comparison across dialects, things like that, 
you're not going to do as much innovative new work as I think is called for to really do something groundbreaking with these texts. But what I think I can do is ask, how do these texts perhaps relate to the historical figure of John the Baptist? And so that's my next big book project after I finish a few things that I'm working on, uh, have some sci-fi related things that I'm working on, have a book that I hope to have finished by the end of the summer uh, called What Jesus Learned from Women, which draws on the New Testament as well as some other texts that you've uh, been reading this semester. And so, uh, yeah, the historical figure of John the Baptist, I think is an important one. I think he's arguably one of the most important figures in religious history, and yet he's overshadowed by the traditions that emerged from him. Uh, Gnosticism, right? I think he contributes something important to that. I think he contributes something to what becomes mainstream Judaism, even if it defines itself over against baptismal movements like John's. Uh, Christianity goes its own way, but I think John's influence on Jesus is important. And of course, you know, if between Christianity, Judaism, and the Sabians, uh, if all of those things have some connection with John, then of course Islam maybe owes something to him as well. And so I think there's a long-term impact there, but really what I'm going to be interested in looking at is, can these texts tell us something about the historical figure of John the Baptist? And I think the answer is probably yes, but that's going to take, that's going to take a book to, to explore. So did any of you manage to read those excerpts? Uh, or try to, even if you found them really, really puzzling. Okay, I'll put my ears shut. Say that again? I'll put my ears shut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, James, what I was going to ask you is kind of related to that. If, you know, I tried to pick excerpts that I thought might kind of shed some light on yeah. what they believe and, um, that, you know, had those relationships to like New Testament texts. Could you like, you know, we've tried to focus on the fact that practices can sometimes be as important as doctrines, that Christianity tends to yeah. focus a lot on doctrines, but could you maybe just sketch out a little bit more clearly what it is that they believe? I mean, they believe in being baptized repeatedly, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but there's also this, you know, this m important myth, right? Um, and if you could yeah. maybe just talk a little yeah. bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah. So like other uh, groups that are put under that broad heading of Gnostic, it's clear that the Mandaeans have been um, eclectic in their interaction with other traditions. And so you don't find one cohesive creation story. Some are more... Um, monotheistic or monistic in the way they talk about origin. There is one supreme uh, figure, the great first life, from whom issues, you know, uh, the, you know the, the second first life, the third, you know, it sort of issues out from there. And then eventually you reach a turning point where things go astray. In the Coptic sources, often that's uh, Sophia, right, who wants to create, and then you get a figure like um, Yaldabaoth or somebody like that, right? And so we're in Mandaism, pardon? Not to interrupt, but we're actually going to be reading Secret Revelation of John next. Right. So y'all, this is actually pertinent to that, right? Yeah. The figure that he's talking about is in Secret Revelation of John. And that's one of the texts from Nag Hammadi that actually is thought to be particularly close in a lot of ways to things that are found in Mandaism. Because it's in a, a dialect of Aramaic, there are some interesting aspects of this. So on the one hand, there are some light world figures on the good side of things, right? Before things go badly and you get the material world coming into existence. Uh, that have names like Yoruba and Yoshimin. And those seem to come from uh, basically Hebrew or Aramaic terms like Yah of heaven and Yah the great. Right, so these sound like, like pre-exilic Israelite names. And so how do these things become part of this tradition? And so that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at. 
Um, and it's, it's sort of a tangent from the John the Baptist question. But one of the mysterious puzzles for historians is where does Gnosticism actually come from? Like, what's the, what's the spark <laughs> that uh, brings it into existence? Uh, a divine spark, if you will. And because it seems to be encased in all this matter that sometimes obscures that divine spark. And I think one of the things that the Mandaeans can do usefully is give us a different environment of Gnosticism that was drawing on different things. And so it may give us a way of tracing it back to that source. One of the things that's puzzling potentially about Gnosticism is that it always seems to have this really intense interest in the Genesis creation story and yet doesn't like the creator. And so I think one possible explanation for the origins of Gnosticism is that it is, in essence, a solution to the problem of evil, right? Why is the world so messed up? The creator of this world was messed up. And in one fell swoop, you explain how the creator can be uh, making matter, which is viewed negatively in, particularly in the, the Greco-Roman era, right? A lot of philosophers were thinking that this is not not good stuff to be working on, and that the supreme deity ought to be kind of distant from that, uh, transcend that. But also, right, how can this deity be walking around in the garden and looking for this lost couple? I mean, how do you lose these things? You know, the supreme god wouldn't do these things. And so the problem of anthropomorphism, right, these uh, human depictions of the divine in Genesis and things like that, all those problems, you can explain them by saying, well, this is a lesser figure, who made this messed up world, and the supreme god is a separate figure. And there you go. And so in Mandaism, the, the figure, the malevolent figure who gives the Torah and, you know, sort of is, rules over the present world, is referred to as Adonai, right, who's identified with the sun in some texts. And that's interesting because there are synagogue mosaics from Mesopotamia, as well as from elsewhere in the world, that depict the tribes of Israel as the signs of the zodiac, with the sun representing God in the middle, right? And so this, again, seems to be something that's in conversation with Jewish imagery, imagery that was used in mainstream, more mainstream Judaism. And so you may remember in the excerpt, there's reference to the, the seven and the twelve, and those are the, the sun, moon, and the five visible planets, right? So the he seven heavens, right? Uh, I don't know whether any of you have ever said, you know, I'm in seventh heaven. Uh, that expression still mm -hmm. persists. Uh, there was a TV show, seven heaven. You know, there's like all kinds of references that you might get. Uh, Paul the apostle says he was caught up to the third heaven, right? And all this reflects what's sometimes referred to as the Ptolemaic view of the universe, right? Where you have these spheres around the earth. And then the supreme deity lies beyond those spheres. And so for Paul, as for the Gnostics, these spheres are places where malevolent forces rule over the world. And those forces are represented by the sun, moon, the planets, and the, the stars, the signs of the zodiac representing those, which are the 12, right? And then beyond that, you get into the realm of the good, right? And in Gnosticism, including in Mandaism, human beings, right, the first creation, right, there are two creation stories in Genesis, and one is of a celestial human being that then gets trapped in this material world by these malevolent forces and seeks to reconnect and escape. And so baptism, as I mentioned, is essentially a way of preparing for that journey into the realm beyond death and getting ready to return and navigate those one's way through those spheres and through the, the obstacles that one will confront in order to reconnect with one's own divine origin, as it were. Thank you. And any anything else? I'm realizing, well, we, we have just a couple minutes, but... Um, you know, y'all, I guess what I would like to say is that when you read the secret revelation of John, you're going to find that it's also very esoteric. It's 
I think, the most difficult text that we're going to read, actually, the text for today and, and the text for um, Thursday with the secret revelation of John. And so I'm going to send an email with just a few more kind of notes. But um, what's really important is to read the introduction in a new New Testament and then also to read the paper that Shirley has sent to you, which is a draft of a book that she's working on. Um, because the text itself, I think you're going to find a, a little bit difficult on a first reading. So just kind of skim through it once, but, um, and we'll go back and unpack some things. But I think that was probably true with, with what you were reading today. But this idea of dualism is very important. And that's a little different than some of the other texts that we've been reading, right? So you can see how different this is from like Acts of Paul and Thecla or uh, even, you know, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, you don't get any of this kind of stuff really spelled out, right? So, um, so that's something that we're going to talk about a lot as well. But um, I just want to thank you, Dr. McGrath. You've done just a wonderful job, I think, of, of talking about this. And it is interesting um, to think about the fact that these people are still around. And I mean, is there any thought that they are, like, do we actually know whether the Jewish practices, like, what, do they de develop at the same time or which one comes first? We don't know that, right? So one can, one can try to deduce that from their texts. The copies that we have of their texts are all, you know, within, you know, a couple of centuries old, right? So as with a lot of these texts that you've been reading this semester, we don't have very old copies of them. And in some cases, we're lucky that one survived and it was a copy of copies of copies. One of the things that the Mandaeans have, though, that others don't, is they have these scribal colophons at the end of their texts where each scribe, because copying the text was a meritorious act to engage in, uh, uh, you know, sort of earning merit for the afterlife and that sort of thing. And so they would add their name. And so we have these long lists of scribes who copied it. And so we can get a sense of, you know, how far back these things go. And they probably are ultimately as old, the tradition is ultimately as old its sources as maybe the Nag Hammadi texts, you know, maybe go back to the third century. But on the other hand, one of the, I think, most important things that we were able to discover and my colleague, uh, Charles Heberl, was able to discover was that the Book of John is not just one unified work from one time period. So the language in different parts of it is different, like demonstrably different, grammatically different. So forms that are really archaic are used in some places, and then they've fallen out of use and are, do not appear in others. And so we also can deduce something of the history of the tradition. But there's a lot more to be studied in terms of, you know, what does this have to do with John the Baptist? How does it relate to, uh, you know, does it show any knowledge of or influence of, you know, Levitical priestly practices of things like that, um, temple imagery and those kinds of things, right? There are probably more points of contact with details of Jewish ritual than have been noticed because so few people have worked on these texts and studied them and given them the attention they deserve. And so let me conclude with an invitation to people who might be thinking, yeah, I want to learn more about this. Yes, I want to become a religion scholar and study this for the rest of my life or something like that. Uh, not sure if that's persuaded anyone, but if not you, then you know, encourage your friends who are religion, uh, budding religion scholars. But when I went to that first conference about the Mandaeans, Unlike a conference on the New Testament where you're trying to think of something slightly new to say about these texts that have been studied over and over again and so much has been written about them, every paper at that conference contained a list of several things that it would be great if somebody somewhere would finally work on this. And there's a sense in which that's a breath of fresh air and that's one reason why I found it so exhilarating to work on this. But you also don't have you know, the, the shoulders of others to stand on to see as far as you'd hope to. And so we need more people working on these things. And hopefully, uh, hopefully, the, hopefully we're at the point where there's going to be a renewed period of interest in the subject and in these texts and in this living tradition. 
All right, listen, thank you so much. There's so much we could say, but we're out of time for today. So we just uh, so much appreciate your coming and sharing with us. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I also just wanna say that I think Dr. Gr McGrath mentioned this, but he really did design the heresy course. So I've been standing on your shoulders in many ways this semester, even though we've used a different text um, in using a new New Testament. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I just really appreciate it because this is a group that I myself have not been very familiar with. And I think it's just fascinating uh, to learn about them and, and also to think about um, how these are people in our world, right? Here, right here in the United States. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you for the chance to share this thing that I think is really interesting with, with all of you. And yeah, I, maybe I'll say as a, one last thing, if, if all of you talk about it with Dr. Saxon and you're all happy with uh, this, um, I think, because I think Zoom records these things, being online somewhere, like on YouTube or something like that, I think it would be great to have a chance to, you know, sort of share this and help get the word out about the Mandaeans and give people a chance to listen in um, if, you're, if you're willing to do that. So uh, don't feel the need to answer on the spot, but if you are, then um, I'm sure we, there's a way we can make that happen. Uh, Mandaeans actually find some of these things online and appreciate them sometimes. And when people ask them, who are you people? They, they point to our YouTube videos and stuff, blog posts and things like that, which I said is daunting, but is also something of an honor. So you can be part of that if you, if you so choose. <laughs> which kind of the whole emic etic debate, I think comes up there, right? You know, yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah. And, um, and also I just wanted to say quickly, you know, we've talked so many times about how you don't have Hinduism, right? You don't have any of these isms, you have these various groups that then get categorized as a thing yeah. by people who are coming from the outside. So um, you've just made a lot of good points to help us with both theory and content. So y'all um, hang in there. We're just living in weird, weird times right now. I'm just so happy to see all your faces. I hope you didn't mind putting your screens on because it's like, I just feel like we're more together that way, you know? Um, and so I, I really appreciate that. And we're also going to have a fascinating class with Shirley Paulson, um, who's going to be a guest speaker from Chicago. And um, in fact, you know, of course, Dr. McGrath knows her too. And so I think it's going it, to, it's really good to be doing these two sessions together. And in fact, we'll do a couple sessions with Secret Revelation of John. And then we really will be unpacking, like, well, why would someone call this a Gnostic text? And you know, why is this a heresy or not a heresy, right? There's a lot to, a lot to unpack there. So um, just take it easy, okay? Try to, I hope everybody has their groceries and all that stuff and that you can just kind of settle in and, and you know, try to keep things in perspective as the world kind of is very chaotic around us. Um, and so I guess that's all I'll say for now. Everybody just have a great couple of days, okay? And, and watch for an email. I'll be sending it tonight, and we'll go from there. And are you going into a different world, Dr. McGrath? Ooh, yes, always. Different planet. Uh, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Subtle, subliminal reminder that I'm teaching a course on religion and science fiction next semester. Are you going to deal with the new Picard? Oh, everything will be, anything and everything can be in there. We usually use, like, short stories as starting points, and then if you've watched it, you can bring it into the picture. Wow, but, so like yeah. fun, actually, because I love the new Picard. But anyway, that's another conversation. Okay, all right, I'll see y'all soon.